machine was built up almost in its entirety in a period of less than one decade. In May of 1939, Major General George Thomas, former chief of the military economic staff in the Reich War Ministry, reported that the German army had grown from seven infantry divisions in 1933 to 39 infantry divisions, among them four fully motorized and three mountain divisions, 18 corps headquarters, five panzer divisions, and 22 machine gun battalions. Moreover, General Thomas stated that the German Navy had greatly expanded by the launching, among other vessels, of two battleships of 35,000 tons, four heavy cruisers of 10,000 tons, and other warships. Further, that the Luftwaffe had grown to a point where it had a strength of 260,000 men, 21 squadrons consisting of 240 echelons, and 33 anti-aircraft batteries. He likewise reported that out of the few factories permitted by the Versailles Treaty, there had arisen, and I now quote him, and I am quoting, if you're honest, please, from the document bearing our number, EC28. <coughs> which consists of a lecture delivered by Major General Thomas on the 24th of May, 1939, in the Nazi Foreign Office. General Thomas said, in part, I quote him, the mightiest armament industry, or rather, he reported that out of the few factories permitted by the Versailles Treaty, there had arisen, and I now quote him, the mightiest armament industry now existing in the world. It has attained the performances which in part equal the German wartime performances and in part even surpassed them. Germany's crude steel production is today the largest in the world after America's. The aluminum production exceeds that of America and of the other countries of the world very considerably. The output of our rifle, machine gun, and artillery factories is at present larger than that of any other state. That quotation, I repeat, was from the document bearing the lettering EC and the number after a dash 28. It's United States of America, Exhibit 23. <coughs> These results, the results which General Thomas spoke about in his lecture in May of 1939 were achieved only by making preparation for war, the dominating objective of German economy. And to quote General Thomas again from that same speech, he stated, history will know only a few examples of cases where a country has directed, even in peacetime, all its economic forces so deliberately and systematically towards the requirements of war as Germany was compelled to do in the period between the two world wars. 
That quotation from General Thomas will be found in the document bearing our number 2353. Yes. No. It would help me personally if I knew where in the document you are reading. Very well. Would you like me to refer back to number EC28? I have it before me. Yes. But I haven't the particular passage in the document it's in the, uh, that you are reading. In that document, the one from which I have just been reading, Your Honor, is in document 2353-TS. Well, it's, it's not in EC28. No, it's another quotation from General Thomas, but from another uh, writing of his. Uh, 2353, it's a document. 2353, And it will be found on the third page of that document. 2353 PS. I uh, seem to have only two pages of that. 2353 PS. Well, I'm sorry. And with a, a page a uh, in between. There should be a third page. Oh, yes. There it is. I have it now, yes. The task of mobilizing the German economy for aggressive war began promptly after the Nazi conspirators' seizure of power and was entrusted principally to the defendants' shocked Goering and Funk. The defendant Schock, as is well known, was appointed president of the Reichsbank in March of 1933 and minister of economics in August of 1934. The world did not know, however, the responsibility for the execution of this program was entrusted to the office of the four-year plan under the defendant Goering. And I should now like to call to your honor's attention the document bearing the number EC408. And I should also like to refer at this time to another document for Your Honor's attention while I discuss the material, number 2261 PS. And I continue to say that the world did not know as well that the defendant shocked was designated plenipotentiary for the war economy on May 21st, 1935, with complete control over the German civilian economy for war production in the Reich Defense Council. 
established by a top secret Hitler decree. Your Honor's attention to the document 2261 PS, which I referred to a few minutes ago. Defendant Schacht recognized that the preparation for war came before all else. For in a memorandum concerning the problems of financing rearmament, written on the 3rd of May, 1935, he stated that his comments were based on the assumption that the accomplishment of the armament program us to document uh, 2261. Yes, Your Honor. But you haven't read anything from it. I did not. I merely referred the court to it since it... Uh... It would help us, I think. Very well. When you I refer to the document, do. you refer to some particular passage in it. Very well. I think it must be the middle paragraph in the document. The Führer has nominated the president of the directorate of the Reichsbank, Dr. Schacht. Yes, that is, the, that is the paragraph to which I wish to make reference. Please, I refer to the second paragraph or the middle paragraph, which states in a letter dated June 24th, 1935, at Berlin, the Führer and Reich's Chancellor has nominated the president of the directorate of the Reichsbank, Dr. Schacht, to be plenipotentiary general for the war economy. I might point out, in addition to the second paragraph, the last paragraph of that letter, or the last sentence of the letter, which reads, I point out the necessity of strictest secrecy once more. The letter being signed, von Blomberg. Shock's financial genius, monetary measures were devised to restore German industry to full production. And through the control of imports and exports, which he devised under his new plan of 1934, German production was channeled in accordance with the requirements of the German war machine. I shall with the court's permission, later discuss the details of documentary proof of this assertion. In 1936, with an eye to the experience in the First World War, the Nazi conspirators embarked on an ambitious plan to make Germany completely self-sufficient in strategic war materials 
such as rubber, gasoline, and steel. In a period of four years, so that the Nazi conspirators would be fully prepared for aggressive war. The responsibility for the execution of this program was entrusted to the office of the four-year plan under the defendant Goering. And at this point, I should like to refer to the document bearing the number and the lettering EC408. It is dated the 30th day of December, 1936. Marks secret command matter and, a, and entitled the report memorandum on the four-year plan and preparation of the war economy. It sets out that the Reich, that the Führer and Reich Chancellor has conferred powers in regard to mobilization preparations in the economic field that need further definition. And in the third paragraph, it refers specifically to Minister President General Oberst Goering as commissioner of the four-year plan by authority of the Führer and Reich Chancellor granted the 18th day of October, 1936. The existence of this program involved the reorganization and control of the whole German economy for war. And again referring to Major General Thomas, and specifically to our document marked EC-27. General Thomas, in a lecture on the 28th of February, 1939, made at the Staff Instructors Course, stated, the National Socialist State, soon after taking over power, reorganized the German economy in all sections and directed it towards a military viewpoint, which had been requested by the army for years. Due to the reorganization, agriculture, commerce, and professions became, become those powerful instruments the Fuhrer needs for his extensive plans. And we can say today that Hitler's mobile politics, as well as the powerful efforts of the army and economy, would not have been possible without the necessary reorganization by the national socialist government. We can now say that the economic organization as a whole corresponds with the needs, although slight adjustments will have to be made yet. Those reorganizations made a new system of economics possible, which was necessary in view of our internal and foreign political situation as well as our financial problem. The directed economy, as we have it today concerning agriculture, commerce, and industry, is not only the expression of the present state principles, but at the same time, 
also the economy of the country's defense. Your Honors, please, this program was not undertaken in a vacuum. It was deliberately designed and executed to provide the necessary instrument of the Nazi conspirators' plans for aggressive war. In September of 1934, the defendant shocked, frankly acknowledged to the American ambassador in Berlin that the Hitler party was absolutely committed to war and the people too were ready and willing. And that quotation is, doc is found in Ambassador Dodd's diary and his document bearing our number 2832 PS and United States exhibit number two. Number 29, I'm sorry, United States Exhibit Number 29. And particularly on page 176 of Ambassador Dodd's diary. At the same time, the defendant Schock promulgated his new plan for the control of imports and exports in the interest of rearmament. A year later, he was appointed plenipotentiary for the war economy by the top secret decree referred to a few minutes ago. In September 1936, the defendant Goering announced at a meeting attended by the defendant Schacht and others that Hitler had issued instructions to the Reich war minister on the basis that the showdown with Russia is inevitable and added that all measures have to be taken just as if we were actually in the stage of imminent danger of war. And I refer the court to the document bearing the letters EC dash and the numbers 416, EC 416, and particularly well, before I discuss the quotation, I might indicate that this document is also marked a secret Reich matter, the minutes of the cabinet meeting of the 4th of September, 1936 at 12 o'clock noon. It tells who was present. Defendant Goering, von Blomberg, Defendant Schock, and others. And on the second page of that document, the second paragraph, is found the quotation. By the defendant Goering. It starts from the basic thought that the showdown with Russia is inevitable. What Russia has done in the field of reconstruction, we too can do. And on the third page of that document, in the second paragraph, the defendant Goering stated, all measures have to be taken just as if we were actually in the state and the stage of imminent danger of war. In the same month, the office of the four-year plan was created with the mission of making Germany self-sufficient for war in four years. And I refer back at this point to the document numbered 408, EC 408.
And particularly, refer your honors to the third paragraph again of that document, where the statement is made as regards the war economy. Minister President General Oberst Goering sees it as his task within four years to put the entire economy in a state of readiness for war. <coughs> the Nazi government officials provided the leadership in preparing Germany for war. They received, however, the enthusiastic cooperation of the German industrialists. And the role played by industrialists in converting Germany to a war economy is an important one. And I turn briefly to that aspect of the economic picture. On the invitation of the defendant Goering, approximately 25 of the leading industrialists of Germany and the defendant Schacht attended a meeting in Berlin on the 20th day of February, 1933. This was shortly before the election of March 5th, 1933 in Germany. And at this meeting, Hitler announced the conspirators' aim to seize totalitarian control over Germany, to destroy the parliamentary system, to crush all opposition by force, and to restore the power of the Wehrmacht. Among those present on that day, in February of 1933 in Berlin, were Gustav Krupp, head of the huge munitions firm, Fried Krupp AG, four leading officials of the IG Farben, one of the world's largest chemical concerns. Present, I repeat, was also, also present was the defendant Schacht, and Albert Vogler was there, the head of the huge steel trust, the United Steelworks of Germany. And there were other leading industrialists there. In support of the assertion with respect to that meeting at that time, and in that place, I refer your honors to the document bearing the number EC439. It being an affidavit of George von Schnitzler, and it reads as follows. I, George von Schnitzler, a member of the Vorstand of the IG Farben, make the following deposition under oath. At the end of February 1933, four members of the Vorstand of IG Farben, including Dr. Bosch, the head of the Vorstand, and myself, were asked by the office of the President of the Reichstag to attend a meeting in his house the purpose of which was not given. I do not remember the two other colleagues of mine who were also invited. I believe the invitation reached me during one of my business trips to Berlin. I went to the meeting, which was attended by about 20 persons, who I believe were mostly leading industrialists from the Ruhr. Among those present, I remember Dr. Schacht, who at that time was not yet head of the Reichsbank again and not yet Minister of Economics. Krupp von Bohlen, who in the beginning of 1933 presided the Reichsverband der Deutschen Industrie which later on was changed in the semi-official organization Reichsgruppe Industry. Dr. Albert Vogler, 
the leading man of the Rakte Stahlwerk, von Lohenfeld, from an industrial work in Essen, Dr. Stein, head of the Goekschaft Augusta Victoria, a mine which belongs to the IG. Dr. Stein was an active member of the Deutsche Volkspartei. I remember that Dr. Schacht acted as a kind of host. While I had expected the appearance of Goering, Hitler entered the room shook hands with everybody, and took a seat at the table. In a long speech, he talked mainly about the danger of communism, over which he pretended that he just had won a decisive victory. He then talked about the Bundes Alliance, into which his party and the Deutsche Nationale Volkspartei had entered. This latter party, in the meantime, had been reorganized by Herr von Papen. On the end, he came to the point which seemed to me the purpose of the meeting. Hitler stressed the importance that the two aforementioned parties should gain the majority in the coming Reichstag election. Krupp von Bohlen thanked Hitler for his speech. After Hitler had left the room, Dr. Schock proposed to the meeting the raising of an election fund of, as far as I remember, three million Reichsmarks. The fund should be distributed between the two allies according to their relative strength at the time being. Dr. Stein suggested that the Deutsche Volkspartei should be included. It uh, seems to me that uh, really all that that uh, document shows, all that that document shows is that there was a meeting yes, at right. which Mr. Schacht was present yes. and at which it was determined to uh, subscribe an election fund in 1933. That's quite so, Your Honor. I will not labor by reading all of it. There were some other references, but of not major importance in the last paragraph to uh, the division of the election fund. I just call Your Honor's attention to it in passage. <coughs> I should like at this point to call Your Honor's attention to the document bearing the number DT203. It's a three page document. D-203. Yeah. And I wish to read only excerpts from it very briefly. It is a speech in the court. It is the speech delivered to the industrialists by Hitler. And I refer particularly to the second paragraph of that document. Private enterprise cannot be maintained in the age of democracy. It's a, a speech made at the meeting on the 20th of February, 1933 in Berlin. Yes. <coughs> Private enterprise cannot be maintained in the age of democracy. It is conceivable only if the people have a sound idea of authority and personality. And I refer 
refer to page two of the document. And I should like to read an excerpt from that first paragraph on page two. About 15, uh, 13 sentences down, beginning with the words, I recognized even while in the hospital that one had to search for new ideas conducive to reconstruction. I found them in nationalism, in the value of strength and power of individual personality. And a little further down, the last, the next to the last, and the last sentence of that same paragraph, Hitler said, if one rejects pacifism, one must put a new idea in its place immediately. Everything must be pushed aside, must be replaced by something better. And in the third paragraph, the last sentence beginning, we must not forget that all the benefits of culture must be introduced more or less with an iron fist. Just as once upon a time, the farmers were forced to plant potatoes. And finally, on that page, in the third or fourth paragraph, in the fourth paragraph and nearly the end of it. With the very same courage with which we go to work to make up for what had been sinned during the last 14 years, we have withstood all attempts to move us off the right way. And on the top of the next page, the second paragraph, these words. Now we stand before the last election. Regardless of the outcome, there will be no retreat, even if the coming election does not bring about a decision. Two. While still winning power, or gaining power, one should not start the struggle against the opponent. While still, beginning with the words, while still well, gaining well, power... Possibly the sentence before. We must first gain complete power if we want to crush the other side completely. Yes. While still gaining power, one should not start the struggle against the opponent. Only when one knows what, that one has reached the pinnacle of power that there is no further possible upward development, shall one strike? Yes, I was going to refer to that, Your Honor, please, in a minute. But I, I think it's quite proper to have it inserted here. <coughs> well, now, before starting to read this last paragraph, I suggest that it is nearly custom recess time, as I understand it. It's rather a lengthy yeah. paragraph. Yeah, it is, yes. We'll jump till two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> no.